Mr. President, the line item veto was included in the Constitution of the Confederate States of America. It was first proposed at the federal level by Ulysses Grant in 1873, and three, uh, three years later, in 1876, the first resolution to amend the Constitution to provide to the President of the United States the line item veto was introduced in the House of Representatives by a representative from the state of West Virginia, Charles James Faulkner. And since that time, scores of such resolutions have been introduced in uh, both bodies. Mr. President, uh, last week I spoke of the line item veto and other quick fi fixes. And uh, I stated that through the 12 years of the Reagan and Bush administrations and continuing into today, uh, these uh, popular fixes, I should call them expediences, have been and uh, continue to be advanced as cure-alls for the bloated budgets that, that have us drowning in a sea of red ink. I stated last uh, Wednesday that we have a responsibility as members of the Senate and members of the House to examine these popular expediences uh, through the broader context of hundreds and hundreds of years of history. Which preceded the brilliant work of the constitutional framers in developing the counterweights of constitutional checks and balances in Philadelphia in 1787. And we have also a duty to remember our solemn oath to protect and defend this delicate structure. I spoke on last Wednesday of the covenant that we have with the past, the dead who have gone on before us, and the covenant that we have with the yet unborn who will reap the harvest that we leave behind. I said then that that is a solemn covenant. It is not one to be taken lightly, and we have a duty to perpetuate that covenant. A duty to those of the past who now sleep in calm assurance that we will not betray the confidence that they have placed in our hands and a covenant with, with the future. Those who wait in the beyond confident that we will not cheat them of their birthright. Mr. President, my purpose in saying these things and in making these speeches is to sound a note of caution and to jar us out of the complacency of focusing our attention solely on the immediate. For if we as a nation and if we as senators succumb to the nearsightedness of only the immediate, only that which is imminent, and uh, 
the egoism of only that which affects us personally, then, Mr. President, we're surely lost. I spoke of that uh, great author, philosopher, Montesquieu, who was greatly influenced by the contemporary institutions of his time in England and by the history of the Roman people. He wrote uh, an essay, a famous essay, on the greatness and decline of the Romans. And it is commonly believed that his knowledge of the Roman history and his recognition of and belief in the institutions of England, that these most influenced him in his development of political theory, a political theory which was subscribed to by our forefathers who wrote the Constitution. That theory being that the three powers, judicial, executive, and legislative, should be separated and be distinct from one another, and that the result would be political freedom. Whereas if those three powers were lodged in one individual, as in France, it was Montes Montesquieu's belief that the result would be tyranny. And so, Mr. President, I believe that we should examine the history of these great people, these very remarkable people, the Romans, and uh, their extra, extraordinary state system, uh, which so much influenced Montesquieu, and through him influenced the framers of the American uh, Constitution. And as we examine these, and this will necessarily have to be a brief and very abridged capsulation of Roman history and Eng English history as they are brought to bear upon our discussion of the separation of powers and checks and balances, the supreme balance wheel. the supreme pillar upon which the constitutional system of our country rests. As I discuss these, I will discuss only a few events which constitute milestones, as it were, in the history of the Roman people and which will bring out those extraordinary factors in Roman life and those extraordinary things about the Roman people that should be of importance to us today as we see our own republic deteriorating as in many ways, many of the same ways, the Roman Republic finally collapsed. And the things that caused its collapse, the things that made it, the for, made the, the Romans the foremost people of their time, and made the Roman Republic the foremost republic of ancient time, and made the Roman Empire the foremost ancient empire. National pride led the Romans to connect their history with the history of the Greek world. 
and led them to forge links with Greek mythology. Tradition, therefore, developed the legend of the flight of Aeneas from Troy with his father, Anchises, and his son, Ascanius, who found the ancient city of Alba Longa in Italy in circa 1152 BC, from which Rome was an offshoot and which was the legendary birthplace of Romulus and Remus. Thus evolved the foundation stories which attributed a Trojan origin to the Romans through Aeneas and attributed to his descendants, Romulus and Remus, the founding of Rome in, 70, in 753 B.C. Tradition has it that Romulus and Romus were set afloat in a basket on the river Tiber by their mother, Rhea Silvia. She having been so commanded by the king, King Apuleius, King Amulius. The basket was later found by the keeper of the royal flock, Faustulus, who gave these two twins they were, who took the twins from the basket and gave them to his wife Laurentia to rear. In due time, they decided to found a city. And they decided to let the gods determine by augury. From whom the city would be named and who would govern the city. And so they agreed that the gods would indicate to them through augury these things. Remus was the first to observe six vultures flying overhead. And he accepted this as an augury from the gods. Romulus, waiting on another, another of the seven hills of Rome, later saw 12 vultures. And so each laid claim to the kingship. Remus, by virtue of his having priority in seeing the augury first. Romulus, by virtue of his having seen double the amount of vultures in the augury. And throughout the by the way, throughout the long history of, of, the, of Rome, it was felt that the 12 vultures indicated that Rome would exist for 12 centuries. And indeed, it did exist. The western seat of the Roman Empire existed 1,229 years, from, seven, from 753 B.C., 476 A.D. So the followers of each, Romulus and Remus, laid claim to the kingship. There developed a contention between the two, and Romulus, in a fit of anger, slew his brother, Remus. The city was named after Romulus, and uh, he became the first king. 
And he ruled from 753 to 716 B.C. He created the Senate, a Senatus, from which the Senate emerged. He created the Senate of a membership of 100 of the leaders of the top families, the clans. And the purpose of the Senate was to advise Romulus the king and to aid him in the administration of the city. Romulus then determined that the men who had come from various areas in the region, nearby region, needed some wives. And so he, upon the advice of the Senate, sent embassies around to the neighboring tribes to see if they would enter into an alliance and be willing to intermarry with the men of Rome. The neighboring tribes rejected these embassies. And so according to tradition, Romulus invited the Sabines to participate in some games in the honor of Neptune. And at the games, at a given signal, the Romans seized the maidens of the Sabines and carried them away. There then developed a war between the Sabines and the Romans. But by that time, the wives of the Romans were attached to their Roman men, and they pleaded with their fathers and brothers and their husbands on both sides to stop the war and to live at peace. And so the two contending peoples did that. The Sabines, however, felt that they ought to have someone who would share the sovereignty with King Romulus. And so Titus Tatius, a Sabine, was chosen. And for a while, those two men worked and ruled together in peace and harmony. Ultimately, Titus Tatius was killed by a mob and Romulus, once again, became the sole ruler of Rome until the year 716. And in a severe storm, he was enveloped in a, in a cloud and during a great clap of thunder was swept up into heaven. The Romans were without a king for about a year as the senators could not decide on anyone in particular. Finally, the people demanded that there must be a king, and so the, the Roman Senate told the people that they could select a king, but that they, that person would be king only after the Senate, the Senate stamped its imprimatur upon him. And the plebeians, the, the people generally, thought that this was a very gracious uh, act upon the part of the Senate, and they said, you, you senators, select the king. And the, and the Sabines felt that they ought to have a king, since Titus Tatius had been dead for some time, and so there was a very pious and just man who was a Sabine by the name of Numa Pompilius. The people accepted the Senate's selection of Numa Pompilius as king. And he reigned from uh, 715, one year having elapsed as an interregnum following the death of Romulus. He reigned from 715 to 672. Numa Pompilius, being the religious and just man that he was, thought that the, 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 the Romans, this new city of people, should be imbued with 
a respect and reverence for providence, for the gods. And so he pretended to have nocturnal meetings with Egeria, a nymph or goddess of water. And from her he pretended as he came back to his people. He pretended to have received instructions as to the priesthood and as to the establishment of religious rituals. And so Numa Pompilius established the priesthoods established the rituals, the various ceremonies which would be held in worship of the various and sundry gods. And he appointed the Vestal Virgins to carry out the, vest the Vestal service and provided for a stipend for them. Uh, and decreed that they should maintain their virginity throughout their, their service. So from the beginning, the Roman people were imbued with a reverence for providence. Theirs were pagan gods, but they worshipped them, worshiped them, and they felt that these gods had an interest in their destiny, the destiny of the Roman people. And that it was their purpose as a people to carry out and carry forward that destiny of the Roman people. So from the very beginning, we see that deep reverence for the gods. Then upon the death of uh, Numa Pompilius in 672, the, the uh, people elected and the Senate confirmed the next king, Tullus Hostilius. And he taught the Romans the military arts. He built a Senate, a Senate house for the 100 members of the Senate. And he led the Romans in their frequent wars. They were, actually, they were constantly warring with neighboring tribes. And he reigned until 640 B.C. And then Ancus Martius was chosen king. He reigned from 640 to 616 B.C. He built the first bridge across the Tiber. He built the first prison in the city to deal with the law lawlessness, such as it was. Then we did, when he died, Lucius Tarquinius Priscus, an Etruscan, became king. He reigned from 616 to 578. He was a good king. He increased the Senate membership to 200. And he undertook to build a wall around the unfortified sections of the city. He was the first to, I suppose, to make a political speech in the effort to sway the multitude. He was the first to campaign for the kingship. And he built sewers that led down uh, to the Tiber. Then, uh, in 578 upon his death, Servius Tullius was named king by the people and confirmed again by the Senate. The people chose, but the Senate had to ratify their choice, always. Um, Servius Tullius, he instituted the first census among the Romans. And he reigned from uh, 578 to 534. Then the last of the seven kings, Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, Tarquin the Proud, became king. 
He reigned from 534 to 510 B.C. And he was the first king to disregard the advice of the Senate. And uh, he decided capital cases by himself without advice. So that he struck terror among the population. He executed a good many of the senators. And sitting as the sole judge in civil and criminal cases, he was in a position to exile or to execute or to forfeit, declare forfeit the lands and properties of the peoples. So in this way, he was able to plunder and enrich himself. Ultimately, his son, Sextus, uh, Tarquinius Sextus, raped the wife of Tarquinius Collatinus. Shakespeare writes about this in The Rape of Lucrece. And Lucius Junius Brutus, a friend of, Car of Tarquinius Collatinus, rallied the people around him, himself, and drove Tarquin the Proud out of Rome with all of his family. Lucretia had, after telling her father and her husband, Collatinus, about this crime, committed by Sext Sextus Tarquinius, had killed herself, committed suicide. Lucius Junius Brutus, therefore, took up the cause, and as I say, drove Tarquin the Proud out of Rome, and uh, Sextus Tarquinius was eventually slain. This was in five... 10 BC. For a year, there was no ruler of the Roman people. Lucius Junius Brutus made the Roman people swear that they would never again submit to the rule of kings. He was chosen consul, and with him was chosen a colleague. Tarquinius Collatinus. They were the first two Roman consuls. The Roman consuls were colleagues. Each could serve for one year. Each was given the imperium, in other words, the supreme command over civil and administrative and military affairs. Each had 12 lictors. The lictors were men usually of the lower class who preceded the consul and cleared the way for him, who executed his orders, and who executed people in the event that the consul decreed such an execution. These lictors would carry a bundle of rods made of elm or birch, and in the midst of these rods were axes to indi indicate the supreme authority of the officer having the imperium. These were called fasces. So that each consul had 12 lictors. Later on, when preachers were created, they, each of them only had six lictors. Later on, a dictator was created. He had 24 lictors, showing that his command was supreme even over the consuls. Here we see a check and balance. Each consul had equal authority with the other consul. 
each consul could veto the actions of the other consul. And each consul, as I say, could only serve one year. So the Romans were determined that nobody would become such a power as to equal that of a king again. So you have these checks and balances between these two consuls. And all other magistrates were subordinate to them. They carried out the wishes of the Senate, the recommendations of the Roman Senate expressed through what was called a senatus consultum. It did not have the force of law, but in de facto, it was the same as law. Tarquin, Tarquin the Proud, having been driven from Rome, he solicited the support of uh, Lars Porcina, an Etruscan king, king of Clusium, a very powerful king. The support of Lars Porcina in restoring him, Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, to the throne, to the kingship of Rome. Lars Porcina came with a great army and started across the Sublician Bridge across the Tiber. Horatius Cocles, one of the foremost of the Roman military men, stood on the bridge with two companions and withstood the attacks of this Etruscan army, urging in the meanwhile that the Romans destroy the bridge behind him so that the Etruscan army could not get across the river. The bridge was destroyed. Horatius Cocles plunged into the river and swam to safety. And this uh, is the subject of one of Macaulay's lays of ancient Rome. This occurred somewhere between 509 B.C. and 500. The Romans were divided into two distinct classes, the patricians who held all the seats of authority and the offices in the priesthood, membership in the Senate. Those were the patricians. And for a long time, the Senate was made up of the sons of senators, and they inherited the seat. I should mention that Brutus, the first consul, added 100 members to the Senate, bringing his membership to 300. But the patricians and the plebeians had this ongoing contention. The plebeians feeling that they were they felt great offense in that there could not be intermarriage between the patricians and the plebeians. The patricians held, as I say, all of the important offices of authority in the military and in the civil administration, in the Senate. They were the more wealthy of the people. And uh, yet the plebeians helped to do the fighting, furnish most of the military uh, most of the soldiers, uh, those that had property, because whether one served in the military depended upon his, his property, whether or not he owned property, and consequently his voting in the commissia curiata depended upon his ownership of property as well. Also, the, the plebeians were ridden down heavily by debt. They were, weren't able to stay on their farms very long at a time because they had to go off and leave their farms and fight for the city in its frequent wars with the neighboring tribes. And consequently, they, they went into debt.
creditors were given the right to exile or to even to execute or to sell into slavery. The debtors. So, uh, in 494 BC, circa always, the plebeians seceded to the sacred mount, about three miles from the Anio River, and uh, threatened to become a city within a city. The Senate and the patricians became uneasy because they knew they had to have the plebeians in order to fight the wars, and they were concerned that some invader might choose this particular moment to invade the city, and so the Senate sent one of its foremost members, Meninius Agrippa, out to the sacred mo uh, mount to plead with and attempt to reconcile the plebeians. And he uh, he told the famous fable, the famous uh, story of the fable of the belly about the interdependence between the belly and the various members of the body. The Philippians were reconciled, but only after they had gained the concession of being able to elect someone of their own as an official who would protect them and their property against the patricians. And that person was called a tribune. So they were allowed to elect two tribunes in 494 and Later, I believe about 457, these two were increased to 10. And in later times, they were increased even to greater numbers. There were both military tribunes and, and, uh, and the uh, civil tribunes. Here again, we saw checks and balances come into play. Any tribune, each tribune, at first, as I say, there were only two, two, two tribunes. Each tribune could veto the acts of the other tribune. Each, each tribune could veto the acts of a consul. Each, each, tribune, each tribune could veto and annul, uh, annul the senatus consulta. proclamations and advice of the, of the Senate. They were declared inviolable. And the plebeians swore an oath that if any individual interfered with a tribune, harmed him in any way, or disregarded that tribune's veto, that individual would be executed without trial. And so the tribune was given great power. And the aura of inviolability. So here we have two consuls, we have two tribunes. This veto working back and forth. And the Senate with its 100 men. Then in 490, circa 490 BC, the Romans were at war with the, the Valsians, and they laid, laid siege, the Romans laid siege to the town of Coriola. There was a young man by the name of Neus Martius. I use uh, what I suppose is the accepted American pronunciation. I'm not, uh, I, I, I'm, I certainly am not uh, able to use the classic, classical pronunciations of these names, but what I'm using is, is I think, as near as I can determine 
the American X, the American pronunciation, or the English pronunciation. I think it's Martians. Nias, Nias, or Nias, Martians. As the city was being besieged, the second Volscian army attacked the Romans, whereupon the besieged Volscians within the city made a sortie out, and the Romans were being pressed from both sides. Whereas this young man saw that the gates were left open when the Volscians essayed from the city, he ran into the city and set it on fire. And as a result, of the, in this great confusion, the Volscians fled, the Romans prevailed, and uh, he was given the surname of Coriolanus. Shakespeare writes about Coriolan Coriolanus. Coriolanus then was encouraged to run for the office of uh, consul, but he was defeated because he made uh, he made the kind of speeches that were, were not likely to gain the support of, uh, of the electorate because he told the truth. He gave them the facts. He wasn't a demagogue. So as a result, they ran him out, out of the city. He was exiled and he went, up, went over to the Valtians. And his host there was uh, Tullus Attius, the leader of the Valtians. Coriolanus took the Volscians and attacked the city of Rome, camped within five miles of it, and when the Senate sent out the, their ambassadors, leading senators who attempt to prevail upon Coriolanus to lift the siege, they were turned away. Finally, the women of the children of, of the city prevailed upon the wife and sister of Coriolanus to go to Coriolanus with his two little sons and see if they, the mother and wife of Coriolanus, could prevail upon him to lead, lead, lift the siege. And uh, the mother and, and wife did that and in the company of other women, went to the camp of Coriolanus and uh, were introduced to him into his presence and weeping and praying that he would lift the siege. Livy and uh, Dionysius of Halicarnassus name the mother of Coriolanus as Vituria and the wife as Volumnia. But Plutarch and Shakespeare give the mother the name of Volumnia and the wife the name of Virgilia. Also Livius and uh, Dionysius of Halicarnassus give as the name of the Valsian leader Attius Tullus Attius, whereas Shakespeare and Plut Plutarch call the Valsian leader Tullus Alphidius. In any event, the women went out to the camp of Coriolanus. He lifted the siege and went on back and left and, and lived with, with the uh, Volscians. This was in 490. Then in uh, 458 BC, the Romans were being hard pressed by the tribes from the east, the Aquians. And the Aquians were gaining the upper hand. A Roman general and his army had been surrounded by the Aquians for three days. A Roman general by the name of Minucius. And so the Roman Senate de decided to, per to call upon Lucius Quinctius Cincinnatus to take up the fight against the Aquian. Cincinnatus was plowing in his small three-acre farm 
on the west side of the Tiber. According to Livius, there where the shipyards today are. That was in Livius' day. And this delegation from the Senate came out to the field where Cincinnatus was working with the plow. And he uh, asked them what their, why, why they were there. And they, and they told him about the danger from the Aquians and told him that he had been selected as dictator. He was to put on his toga and uh, rid the Romans of, of this threat whereby he wiped the sweat from his face and told his, his wife, Rassilia, that um, his fields would not be sown this year and that they would be in great danger of not having enough to live on. He left the farm and uh, defeated the Acrians laid down the dictatorship within a period of 16 days and returned to his little farm and his plowing. So here we see the creation of another office, the dictatorship. Dictatorship could be a dictator, could only serve for six months. That was the, that was the utmost length of the term which a dictator could serve. But he had supreme imperium over the consuls even. He had 24 lictors, as I've indicated. But Cincinnatus demonstrated that rare old-fashioned quality of not wanting to rule. He was, the, he was the, the model of old-fashioned simplicity and ab ability and honesty and integrity. So he laid down the office. So now we have seen the office of senator, the office of consul, the office of tribune, the office of dictator. The dictator had complete command of everything. He could stop all business, decree that no business be transacted, and he could raise an army and uh, execute the laws and execute people. This was in 458. The tribunes, meanwhile, kept agitating to have the same rights and to be governed by the same laws as the patricians were governed by. The tribunes prevailed upon the Senate to send a delegation to Greece to study the, the laws of Solon. And about uh, circa 454 BC, a commission went to Greece and returned after studying the laws of Solon. And in 451, 10 individuals were selected and given all authority, all power, even over the consuls, supreme authority. They were given one year to promulgate the laws so that patricians would have the same knowledge of the laws as previously only the, uh, the plebeians would have the same knowledge of the laws as previously only the patricians had. Only the patricians had the knowledge of the law, the knowledge of legal proceed procedure and so on. And so the plebeians were at a great disadvantage as a re result there. From. The Decembers met and over a year promulgated 10 tables of law. There, were, there was some work that remained to be done. Consequently, uh, 
they assumed this authority for one additional year. And during that year, two additional tables of law were, were produced, mainly by Lucius Valerius Potitus and Marcus Horatius Barbatus, two men who uh, were members of the Roman Senate. So these then were 12 tables of law. They were created, and promulgated, and placed among some say bronze tablets, others say wooden tablets, which in turn were deposited in the Roman Forum. The 12, the law of the 12 tables. And for a long time, this was the basic law, civil and governing civil and uh, this was the basic civil and criminal law. The 12 tables were, were destroyed uh, when Brennus and the Gauls captured Rome in 390 BC. But Cicero and, the, and the, the children of the Romans were, were required to memorize the law of the 12 tables. Cicero memorized the law of the 12 tables. He was born in 106 BC and died in uh, 43 BC, the year after Caesar was assassinated. Cicero memorized the law of the 12 tables. And so even though the law of the 12 tables, the laws of the 12 tables were destroyed in the invasion, by the invasion and capture of Rome under Brennus, destroyed by the fires, the laws were written again through the recollection and memories of the people. This was 450, 451, 450 B.C., the law of the 12 tables. Then 445 B.C., under the Canulean law, named after a Roman tribune by the name of Canulius, the, the patricians and the plebeians were allowed to intermarry. So again, the plebeians had gained uh, something that they had been seeking for a long time, the right of intermarriage. In uh, 443 BC, the office of censor was created. The censor was elected uh, once every five years. He was elected for a term of 18 months, and he took the census and assessed the property of the Romans for the purpose of taxation and so on. He also had the jurisdiction over the public contracts, letting the contracts for buildings, for highways, and, and so on. And in a later time, uh, we will recall that Cato, Cato the Elder, was a censor. And the censors could enroll people into the Senate or into the equestrian, or, equestrian order, about which I'll have more to say later. And he could purge the roles of senators. He could uh, expel a senator. He could remove a senator from office because of bad conduct on the part of the Senate, senator, public or private. So now we have the office of censor, 443 B.C. President, how much time do I have left, Madam President? From West Virginia has five minutes and 12 seconds remaining. Five minutes? Correct. I thank, thank the chair. Hurrying on now to another milestone. In 396 BC, a man by the name of Marcus Furius Camillus 
was able to capture the Etrurian city of Villa, which had been at war with the Romans for about 10 years. Marcus Furius Camillus was able to capture the city by burrowing a tunnel underneath it and having his men come up in the central fortress in the midst of the city. And later, he was indicted by a tribune for having uh, not made it, allegedly, not having made it an accurate accounting of the plunder that had uh, resulted from the capture of Via. And so he was exiled. In 390 BC, Brennus and the Gauls captured Rome and um, executed many of its citizens and were prevailed upon to lift the siege only upon the delivery by the Romans of several, several hundred pounds, I believe a thousand pounds of gold, several hundred pounds of silver, and several hundred pounds of pepper, together with robes and other valuable uh, cloths. Camillus was requested by the Senate to come back, and he was made dictator. He com came back and found the Gauls, the Gallic, the, the Gallic chieftain, and the Romans uh, dickering over the gold, whereupon Camillus commanded his army to put down their baggage and prepare to fight. And he said to the he said to the Romans, it is your duty to restore your country, not by gold, but by the sword. He defeated the Gauls and relieved uh, his city. This was in 390 uh, BC. The Samnite Wars uh, took place over the period 343 BC to 290 BC. And then there came the the war with the Greeks who were in southern Italy. The war with Paris the king of the Paris, the war, the battles, the battle of Her battle, battles of Heraclea and Asculum. Uh, Madam President, I, I believe that my hour is about uh, to expire. You have one and a half minutes remaining. I thank the, I thank the chair. So I shall at this time uh, close my examination today of of the Roman peoples and the state system as it was developing, of the checks and balances that we have seen occurring. So what we are seeing as we go along is a state system, a political system, <coughs> that had some checks and balances, the separation of power. The Romans arrived at this system not by reasoned thought, but by experimentation and experience. And by development from events as they, as they went along. Like Kyrgyz in his development of the Spartan system did so by a process of reasoning. But the Romans were not philosophers. They were practical people. Therefore, they arrived at a system through experience, trial, and error over a period of centuries, which was, had, had, was very similar to the system of Lycurgus, as I shall speak about at a later time, a system which in his case was determined through 
thought processes and the processes of reasoning. So in my next, uh, in my next uh, address to the Senate on this subject, I'll pick up with uh, Tarentum, Heraclea, Asculum, and Paris. I yield the floor.